We take the Lord's table every week. We celebrate communion together, proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. We're going to do that now, and we're going to open to a passage of Scripture. And we'd love for you to follow along in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, there's some men coming down the aisles now to hand a Bible out to you if you don't have one. Just slip your hand up, and these men will put a copy of God's Word in your hands. If you don't own a Bible, this is yours to keep. We'd love for you to be able to read God's Word. I'd like to turn your attention this evening to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look together at Romans 8, 33, and 34. And these really are the two verses that are the inspiration behind the words we just sang. Uh, That song that we have one who stands before the throne of God, pleading his own sacrificial work on our behalf. Here's what God says through the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. The opening question in verse 33 is a startling one. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? If you belong to God, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know a couple of things are true. One is you're forgiven. But another is you still sin. Residual depravity in the life of a Christian can cause us to ask the question, what becomes of this sin? And the Christian has enemies. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. And until Revelation 12, which is still yet future, he has access to the throne room of God in an attempt to accuse believers. You and I are certainly chargeable of crimes. And we think about the list of people who could bring a charge against us. I could bring charges against myself. Our family could bring charges. Perhaps angels and demons and Satan could bring charges. Enemies could bring charges. Our friends could bring charges. And yet this is a rhetorical question here. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The answer is no one. And the fortress surrounding that answer is what follows in verse 33. God is the justifier. God is the one who justifies. To enter into God's courtroom in heaven and to discover that God has declared the ungodly to be righteous, to be perfect, to be faultless. That God has actually justified sinners to walk into God's courtroom and say, Aha, I know something about Smedley and he did this and that. No one marches into God's courtroom and says that. No one can bring a charge that will stick or stand because God has done something by which sinners are considered righteous in heaven. Verse 34, another question, who is the one who condemns? And this has no answer. Romans 8.1 begins with the premise, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And here this rhetorical question just hangs in the air. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. God is the one who justifies. No one can condemn. And here is why, verse 34, Christ Jesus is he who died. In other words, a a death was already occurred as the penalty for those sins. Those crimes have already been paid for. Justice has already been satisfied. The claims of God's right justice 
have been met fully in the death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised. That is, Jesus' resurrection validates his death as a substitute satisfaction for sin. If Jesus' death had not paid for the sins that he said to take upon himself, then he himself would have died for those crimes and could not have risen again. But that he rose from the dead means that his payment was accepted. It means that God's justifying work through the death of his son was a fulfillment of his justice. It met the demands of God's right justice. Jesus Christ is the one who died, yes, rather was raised, and who is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf. Believer, you need to know that someone died in your place. That someone rose from the dead, demonstrating that that death actually paid for what he claimed it would pay for. And that he stands in that heavenly courtroom, interceding on our behalf. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. No one can condemn those who belong to him. This is a great meditation for us as we think about our own hearts. There will be a few moments of silence where you will have the opportunity to examine your own heart, to confess any sin that you know of before God, and to rejoice in the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf to have completely taken away the guilt, the condemnation of sin. To have paid for them fully. It's an opportunity for you who are believers in Jesus Christ to rejoice in the forgiveness that Jesus purchased. To plan a path of repentance from sins you've discovered in your own heart. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we want you to know that there is an opportunity for you to place your faith in him, to entrust yourself to him, to turn from yourself and from your sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and this day have eternal life. Would you come to him? If you do not belong to Jesus Christ this evening, then please don't eat the bread, don't drink the cup. These are for believers to celebrate what Jesus has done on our behalf. The men are going to come at this time and uh, pass out the bread and the cup. As you've prepared your heart, uh, please take those as you're ready.